Greetings, Team Ajulam. Karibuni sana tena to the sixth and second last episode of the Daniel series. Today, I want us to look a little bit more closely into Daniel chapter 3. We studied this some time back, but I want us to be able to look at this a bit more closely and to take out some really dope lessons from this chapter. And so, because we're going to be reading Daniel 3, and again, remember, Apa tunakuja kusoma Biblia pamoja. We are coming to study the Word of God together. And so at this point in time, I want you to pause this video and then go and read Daniel chapter 3. Pause the video right now, go read, go read Daniel chapter 3. And then when you're done reading Daniel chapter 3, you can come back and if you're listening on podcast, pause it, whether it's a video or podcast, pause it, go read Daniel chapter 3 and then come back. Great! Welcome back! Welcome back! Welcome back! Now, we obviously looked at Daniel chapter 3 a few weeks ago and we were talking about bold faith and we talked about how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and a bad Negro lived a bold, bold faith. And as we have read in this chapter, this story reminds us of what bold faith looks like, right? If you remember the last time when you read it, now we know and we see what bold faith looks like. Now, last week, we talked about how God is our ever-present help. Our ever-present help, I think this is probably one of the key themes that I always talk about, is about how God is always there to help us. He is our help. And this is part of the reason why the name of Jesus Christ is, is, is the name Yeshua. God is our salvation. God is our salvation. He is our help. And this story shows us that as well. This is what this story shows us in Daniel chapter 3. Now, today I wanted to highlight some additional things that stood out to me from this chapter outside of just the bold faith aspect. Now, as we just read, what has happened is that the king has just set up a, a gold statue. And each time the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music is played, everyone must fall down and worship the statue, right? Now, anyone who does not worship this statue is going to be thrown into a blazing furnace, okay? Man, this is quite intimidating when you think about it. And so what the king does is that he invites all his provincial administration, or say Wagava, right? He invites them to come and witness the dedication of this statue. And while they are there, they are told about what is required of each and every single person once they hear any music that's played, what they're supposed to do, that they're supposed to bow down and worship this gold statue that the king has set up. And so the thing is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I need to stop calling her bad Negro. I don't know what to do. Anyway, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what they have done is that, and you remember from Uko in chapter one, they have demonstrated that they are committed to Yahweh, that they are committed to the Lord, and that this thing that the king is asking of them to do is absolutely in direct contradiction to God's law. I mean, this thing was literally in direct contradiction to the law, the Ten Commandments, right? In Exodus 20, in verse 2 to 4, we are told, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the, for, for I am the Lord your God. Now, this is such a black and white situation. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, this is, this is abs in complete contradiction to God's law, right? It was either... They go against the God's law and bow down again to, to this gold statue or go against the Bukadnezar, right, and face death by blazing furnace. These are the two options that were available to them, right? Now, of course, these guys, I mean, if these guys in chapter one were unwilling to eat the food from the king's table, you can imagine, like, if they were faithful in that little thing, you know that they were going to be faithful in this thing. Right? This is not even a discussion that they were willing to have. Right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego literally say to um, the, the, the king, in fact, it says, what, what happens here is that the king, when he heard, let me just go back, when the king heard that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had decided not to bow down to his gold statue, he says to them in verse 14, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. 
But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? This king is clearly consumed with power. His empire has grown so significantly at this time. And in fact, we're even going to look at this more next week, where he has now become the most powerful king on earth. And so for him, it's unfathomable to him that any, anyone, let alone even any God, would be able to oppose his will to the extent that he's even asking what God can possibly rescue from my hand. So meaning that not only is he just here puffed up in himself, he's just like, no, no, not even just another human being, which God can stop anything that I have desired to do, right? And we'll see this more closely, especially in chapter 4, um, looking especially at Nebuchadnezzar's pride and how this was a downfall for him. You know, the thing that's so interesting is that this story reminds me of the story in John 19 where Jesus is facing trial and he's standing before Pontius Pilate. And Pilate finds no charge against Jesus. But the thing is that the crowds are there like crying out for his blood and crying out that, they, that, 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 that he be crucified. And at this point in time, Pontius Pilate is like, man, I don't see any wrong with this guy. And so what happens is that Pilate then goes to, to Jesus and asks Jesus, where do you come from? Right? Um... And Jesus doesn't answer him. And, and then it says in verse 10, where it says, Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Do you not realize that I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Then Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. You know, the thing that's so interesting is that this world will have you thinking that it has the ultimate power over you. But... The reality is this is that all authority in heaven and on earth comes from God. All authority in heaven and on earth comes from God. And so you may have a situation where you, maybe you're in a work situation and someone comes, uh, someone who is your superior, to come and threaten you that unless you do this thing that is literally against what it is that you uh, you, uh, against your conviction and against your belief, then they will do X, Y, and Z. And so they themselves are so puffed up with power that they do not realize themselves that the power that they have comes from above. I have a friend who was telling me a story about how that they were applying for a contract and this person who they were, um, uh, when, they, when they were going through the application process, or rather I think it was the renewal of their contract actually, that this person who was, you know, the, the one with the power, right, was like, unless you do X, Y, and Z, I'm not going to sign this contract. And so that's what happened, is that they, obviously, uh, he, this, this is a brother in the faith, and he's, he, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a Daniel. <laughs> he's not like the others who are in Wishy Washi. Anyway, he's a Daniel. And the guy was like, listen, we're not going to do this thing. We're just not going to do it. And so the risk around that was that they would then lose this very big contract that they've had and then it wouldn't be renewed. But then what happens is this, is that literally um, as they sit there and, and they're, they're, he's, they're thinking about how he's like, you know, maybe we need to escalate this thing to their boss, the boss of this other person and all these things. And God is just like, you just relax, I got you. Now what happens, ends up happening is that a few weeks later is that uh, this person who thinks they have so much authority over these people was actually removed from their position. How amazing is that? They were removed from their position. And now what happened is that the person who came in was like, oh, the next person who came was like, oh, why, why aren't we renewing this contract? And they had their contract renewed. Now, the thing is that I'm trying to communicate to you is that there's some many times where you've been in situations where it appears that this person has all this power, all this authority, and you're there thinking, oh my goodness, like you cower at the authority. But the reality is this, all authority, like Jesus says here, that you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. And it's the same mentality that we go in as those who are those who are sent, is that the authority that we have does not come from others, it comes from above. And so we don't need to fear men because the authority that they have does not come from anywhere but from God. Amen? Ha! Hallelujah! Anyway, the reality is this, any authority that goes against the authority of God is out of order and can be opposed. And this is exactly what is happening here. But the thing is, is that with these guys, these young men, they are not phased by the threats from the king. Because they recognize that there is a higher authority above this king. 
the ultimate authority, the true authority. The authority from this king comes from that authority. They know where they stand and they had made up their minds that they were not going to go against the law of God, who is the ultimate authority. So in verse 16, what they do is that they say to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. You know, in Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says to us, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so these guys are like, because these men feared God more than they feared the king. The thing that is so interesting is that most people these days fear men more than they fear God. They are more concerned with what people think than what God thinks. This is why it's so easy to compromise because we are more concerned with the opinions of men than with God's opinion. In John 12, 42 to 43, it speaks of how some people believed in Jesus but were afraid to openly acknowledge their faith in him. It says that many even among the leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue for they loved human praise more than the praise from God. They loved human praise more than the praise from God. How about you? You know, it's so interesting like this when you think about this because it's, it's, it's literally now more than ever. It's like we literally live in that context where we are so obsessed with the praise of others, like so obsessed You know, and you think about how when Jesus talks about giving and he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And right now it's one of those things where even the good deeds that we do, we want everyone to see it. Not because we want the reward that comes from God, but because we are looking forward to the reward from men. It says here that they loved human praise more than the praise from God. How about you? Now, what was incredibly remarkable also, about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that their commitment to God was not pegged on whether God would rescue them or not. If you listen to the way these guys say, where they are like, May I, the king, where they say to the king, literally, they are like, God is able to, to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods. That we will not worship the image of gold that you have set up. And I wonder how many times is our commitment to God pegged on what he does for us. But once he doesn't do something for us in the way we want it, we fall away. For some, their commitment to God is conditional. If you do this, And that, then I will be committed. I will remain committed. But the question is, what happens when God doesn't deliver in the way that you thought he would? What if you make a stand for God's word and it leads you to you losing your job? Or like these guys where it was like the story that I mentioned where it's like you're looking at a situation where you're like, this is one of the biggest contracts that we have. And it's like, you go and you are like, this guy... We, we're not going to compromise ourselves. Let's just let go of this thing. Which is what they did. What happens? The faith and commitment that these young men had was that their God, that, that God is able to deliver them from the fire. But even if he does not, they still will not change their allegiance. They had determined within themselves that they were on God's side, regardless of what that path meant, including literally losing their lives in a blazing furnace. Like this was the thing that was the whole thing around it. It was like, because this wasn't like at choices between, at a, if you choose not to, you'll be whipped. This was like, if you choose not to, like this was a gamble with their own lives, literally. 
and they were willing to make that. You know, the thing about this story, it reminds me so much of the story of Joseph. How this young man was sold into slavery by his brothers out of jealousy. And he ends up as a slave in Potiphar's house. And it says in Genesis 39 from 2 to 6, that the Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. And the thing is this, and because God was with Joseph, here is the thing, he literally granted him success as he served Potiphar. But then while he was there, he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and ends up being locked up in prison, where it says that while in prison, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Now, the thing that is so fascinating here is this, is that if you think about it, this guy, Joseph, has been sold into slavery, right, by his brothers. He's been betrayed. The guy enters into Potiphar's house, right? And in Potiphar's house, he is not willing to compromise himself by sleeping with Potiphar's wife. And this stand led to him going into prison. This was a no blazing furnace. This was a, this was a, like a, the, the way the, the, the blazing furnace story, the, the, the deliverance was immediate in terms of these guys were thrown in and they came out like, hey, you know, like God delivered us. In this story of Joseph, this guy has been sold into slavery. He's in Potiphar's house. He's thinking probably, man, my breakthrough. God has finally seen me. And he's excelling in that position. And the guy is falsely accused. And it ends up with him being in prison for years. So meaning that this decision, like I said earlier, it's like you make a stand, then you lose your job. This guy, the story is, he gets into prison. And then it says, in prison, that God was with him. And so you'd think to yourself, but if God is with him, shouldn't he be out of prison? But it says that God is with him in the prison, in the place where it is that he has made a stand and now he's in prison, right? Not only that happens, is that while he's in there, he's in prison, right? Joseph has the ability to interpret dreams, and so he does, and he interprets the dreams for the guys who are Pharaoh's cupbearer and Pharaoh's uh, bread guy, the guy for, for bread, right? And he begins to interpret their dreams, and he says to them, please remember me when you get out. He says this to the cupbearer, and it says that the cupbearer forgot about Joseph for two years. Forgot about Joseph. So now the thing is that this story about Joseph is where it's like, after this whole thing happens, after the two years, is where now his miracle happens, right? Where the guy, Pharaoh, has a dream, he comes, he interprets that dream, and now he's made prime minister, and basically the second in command in all of Egypt. Now the thing for me that has been such, every time I thought about this story about Joseph, my whole thing of contention was, is just that like, when you think about the journey that it took for Joseph to get to where God wanted him to be, or rather the, the, the destiny around him becoming the second in command in Egypt, that the fact that this journey of following through and following after God and his commitment to God would also lead him through a prison continually would blow my mind because I'm just like, Lord, Yanni, you peleka this guy to prison. And my whole thing was is that I kept asking myself, Especially at the beginning, because I remember I had this revelation at the beginning of the pandemic. And I kept thinking to myself, I was like, God, what if I'm in this place for this whole mess of this, this thing of like things being whatever, all over, uncertainty, all that. And I'm thinking, 
what if you have me here for two years? And the question that I, I, I remember at that time, this was now last year, God asking me is, will you still be committed to me? Even if I take you through this experience for two years. And I remember sitting there, because this was the early days of the Rona, and I'm just there. And I remember at that time, I even was refusing to think about that thought because I'm just there like, Lord, may it not be that you're going to do me like Joseph. Yeah? yeah, I'm not trying to be in no prison for two years. But the reality is this, and this is the thing that is being asked of us, is that the question is, is your commitment to God conditional? What happens when God determines, not just like these guys, where they were about to lose their lives, but where it's like Joseph, where it's like, I'm going to have you go through and stay in a prison for X amount of years, because that is the journey that I have purposed for you. And will you still be committed to me when that happens? Right? And let me tell you, this thing is a very sobering thought, but I ask you the same thing. That is your commitment to God conditional? What if at this point in time, when you think about whatever it is that you're going through, and it's like, you're like, my guy, I'm really done. In that time, you have another two years left <laughs> in that prison. What happens? Will you still be committed to God? You know, it's so interesting that having said that, I remember this the other day, I was sitting down with my business partner and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, yeah, we're still in this kind of huge uncertainty, but I cannot fathom that it's been a year and a half of this and I'm still here teaching, <laughs> coming here to encourage you guys and, you know, saying that God is great, God is whatever. And I'm just here like what I could not imagine then, I cannot imagine. But this is the grace of God at work where even for Joseph, he says that even in the prison, God was with him. I'm sure all he desired was his freedom, but God was with him even in the prison. Because the reality is this, is that are you at the place where like this guy is Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego, where come and imbaya and imbaya, but we are not letting go of Jesus. Come and imbaya ni, nimbaya, but we are not letting go of Jesus. Is your commitment to God conditional? This guy said that if they are thrown into the fire, doesn't matter. Because even if he does not, we will not worship your God. We will not bow down to the, the, this gold. Anyway, the reality is this. Even as for us, we're going to have blazing funnest moments when our faith is tested. Where your commitment will be tested. And the question is, when that time comes, is your commitment to God conditional? If you're in that moment right now, is your commitment to God conditional? Whew, man. Anyway, so these guys are thrown into the fire, <laughs> right? Then they are set their minds. Then they are like, may I nibaya, nibaya, already we, did, we did finished a food thing. Now here we're in a blazing, ain't no thing. My guy, we're, we're faithful in the little thing, we'll be faithful in the big thing, right? They make their stand, they're thrown. And then the thing that happens is that the king is so upset, he's so angry. And I can imagine how everyone there in that place is watching these guys and thinking, are these guys crazy? Like, what do these guys, who do they think they are? Right? Who do they think they are? And I'm sure that's, that's what's infuriating the king. Like, oh, so you all think that your God is so great that he can deliver you from my hand. Right? And so the guy, literally, what he does is that he's so infuriated, he tells the guys, I want you to make sure that that fire is seven times hotter than what it needs to be. Seven times. And on top of that, go and get the strongest soldiers and make sure you tie these guys up so that they make, so you make sure that these guys don't come out of that thing. Right? So, these guys are thrown into the fire, and even it was so hot that the guys who threw them in are the ones who die. <laughs> They're the ones who die because it's so hot. The guys who throw them in die, right? And alas, it happens. The miracle happens. It says that a fourth man joins in the fire with them. In verse 27, it says, So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was their hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. And the thing that is so interesting is that the only thing that was consumed by the fire was their restraints. Remember that they were tied up. That was the only thing that they, they went in restrained and came out 
with no restraints. They went in bound and came out with no bounds on them. Right? The fire had not harmed their bodies, their clothes weren't touched, and there wasn't even a smell of fire on them. Isaiah 43 from verse 1 to 2 says to us, But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. When you pass through the waters, he will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, you won't drown. When you pass through the fire, it won't burn you or set you ablaze. Now the thing that I want you to notice is that it says, when, not if. The thing that we need to realize is that none of God's children are spared from the waters of adversity. None of God's children are spared from the fire of tribulation. What he promises us is that when it happens, he will be with us. That just like Joseph being sold to slavery, God is with him. In Potiphar's house, God is with him. While in prison, God is with him, causing him to succeed and find favor wherever he was. That even though he was in the prison, God's favor was with him. I'm sure he must have preferred a more ideal situation than to have favor with the prison warden. But the thing is, is that even in that place, God was with, was with him. That the manifestation of his presence was found in that the adversity that comes will not drown you. The tribulation will not set you ablaze. In Daniel 3, we see a literal manifestation. How when the fire of adversity comes, he is there with us. He is right there with us. Jesus was right there with these young men, demonstrating his unrelenting love towards us, even in our trials. And here is the thing that I love so much about this story. But I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a very difficult season and people can't even tell? This is the grace of God at work in your tribulation. These guys had been through the fire. It did not harm them. But the thing that was so amazing, there wasn't even a smell of fire on them. You know, I remember there was a friend of mine who was telling me how it was so bizarre to her that during some of the most difficult financial season of her life, people would come to her to borrow money because when they would look at her, her life looked like she was doing extremely well. <laughs> for herself. So guys used to come and ask her for and she's just like, why are guys here? Me, I'm having the worst financial season of my life. And there are people here who are coming to ask me for chums and they're saying, I look like I have chums. This is that promise of God at work where even the flames, you, there's no smell of fire. There's no smell of fire. Guys are looking at you, they're like, hey, my God, this guy looks, this guy is glowing. <laughs> yeah, they look at you and they don't even know. They can't see the struggle in you. Where they, they, you've, you, you've literally come out of the fire and nobody can see the struggle in you. There's some people where you look at them and you're like, this guy is struggling. <laughs> eh? This one is going, through, is going through it. And then this is the grace of God at work where you are going through it and people can't even tell because the fire will not set you ablaze. They can't even smell the fire on you. And this is all because of the fourth man that showed up in the fire to stand with these three young men. And that fourth man is Jesus Christ, who stands with us in the midst of adversity. Who stands with us in the midst of adversity. You know, I've shared this story before, and this is actually the first sermon that I preached um, on Adulam. It's a story, and this is the word that God gave me right before COVID in Mark 4, 35 to 41, which is the story of Jesus on the boat with his disciples, and the storm comes. It says, suddenly the storm comes, right? And the thing is, is that all the while this storm is happening, it says that Jesus is asleep. And the disciples wake him, wake him up in a panic, like, you know, teacher, don't you care that we are about to drown? So Jesus wakes up, calms the storm, and then turns to the disciples and asks them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And I recall from that whole message is that the big takeout then 
being that Jesus, where that if Jesus is in your boat, you have nothing to fear. That Jesus on your boat does not guarantee that you will not experience the storm. But it does guarantee that the storm will not be able to drown you. And let me tell you, my friends, there are many times in this season where I have genuinely felt like Jesus is asleep in the midst of my storm. There are so many times this is where, uh, you know, it's just like, it's like are, you, are you seeing this? But I just don't seem to drown. <laughs> when the fire comes and it doesn't seem to set you ablaze. Atam kinyangalia, wezi jua nikona shida. It's like it's glowing. <laughs> right? When the peace is overwhelming in the storm. And the thing is that as I meditate on this story in Daniel 3, it makes me realize that though I don't know why I'm still here in this storm, I know that Jesus Christ, because of the way this thing is not setting you ablaze, that he is with me. Because of the un- overwhelming peace that he is with me. That the fourth man, Jesus Christ, who promises us that he will never, ever let us go through adversity without showing up, without being there with us, that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. He shows us that he's not just the God of the good times and blessings, but also the God who is with us, even in adversity, even in a difficult situation where you may have lost someone or lost something, that even in those situations where he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, because he is with us even in the most difficult of seasons, even when you are in the blazing furnace, where he will not allow this blazing furnace to set you ablaze. He shows us also, This is the most beautiful part about all this, is that he shows us also that in all things we are serving a higher purpose. You remember in in, in the Acts series, we talked about the first martyr, Stephen, who through his tribulation sees a, a vision of Christ Jesus in heaven, standing with him, standing. It says it shows him standing. And though his life wasn't spared, his death was the catalyst for the growth of the church outside of Jerusalem. In the Joseph story, we see God standing with him in every season of his life, even while in prison. And through that, this whole situation, he ends up becoming second in command and millions of lives are saved. In the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when their tribulation came, Jesus stood with them. And it served to bring glory to God and to protect all other Jews in captivity. Where the king decrees in verse 28 onwards, where he says... Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent an angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be burned into piles of rubble for no other god can save in this way. Can you imagine what this meant for all the other exiles that were in Babylon? Because of what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, It meant that all these other people who were in Babylon, all these other Israelites, were given the freedom to worship their God. That they did not have to compromise themselves all because of what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. I have no idea what it is that you're currently going through. Or what season that God has you in at this moment. But what I want you to know is that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he promises to stand with us through all the seasons of our lives. That through every single season at all times, and especially during our moment of testing, he will stand with us. During your moment of tribulation, during your moment of difficulty. He will stand with us. You will not drown. You will not be consumed by the challenges because of him. And on top of that, not only will you not be consumed, but he will turn it around for your good and bring glory to his name in the process. And not only that, save many lives. Because the only way that you're able to have a testimony is by going through a test. 
This is our God who stands with us even during our tribulation and our tests. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is our solid hope, our solid rock. He is the rock that the church is built on. No work of the enemy will prevail against us because of him. And so in your time of testing, in your time of tribulation, stand firm in this, that when our time of testing comes, he will stand with us so we can rest in him. And so my prayer for us today is that I pray in Jesus' holy name that your faith will not fail in your trial, that your faith will not fail in your tribulation, that your faith will not fail in your time of testing because God is with you even in this place that does not look fruitful like Joseph, you're in a prison. And it says that God caused him to succeed in that place. That wherever it is, that whatever season that you're in, it does not matter because Jesus Christ stands with us. And not only that, that he brings glory to his name through that. And not only does he bring glory to his name, but he will literally, it will work out for your good. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego received a promotion after this. And not only did they do that, but it also served a broader purpose in being able to save many lives. And your testimony will save many, many lives. And so stand firm in your commitment to God. Stand firm in your faith in Christ Jesus, even in your trial. Amen? Amen and amen. And for anyone else who's listening to me, I want to close with this. In earlier I asked, and the thing that I said is that if Jesus is in your boat, takwa tu sawa. And so the question for you is this, is Jesus in your boat? And if you desire that Jesus would come into your boat, he is the insurance for any season. He is our guarantee. He is our, he's our blessed assurance throughout our lives because we know that he is the God who comes to give us eternal life and eternal life begins as soon, right now, when we receive him, eternal life begins. And the thing that's so beautiful about this is that it means that it does not matter what it looks like, even in a dry season, you know that because you're connected to the vine, fruitfulness will come. This is the Jesus Christ whom we serve who has promised us eternal life. And I want to invite you now, if you want to be able to bring and allow Jesus to come into your life, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I confess that I am a sinner in need of your grace. And so now I come to you to acknowledge that I believe in you and I believe in what you have done for me. Come into my life. Change me, mold me, shape me, and lead me. You are Lord over my life. In Jesus' holy name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, go over there, down there. WhatsApp us on the, in, the, in the caption. Just There's a link there. Send us a WhatsApp. Tell us about the decision that you've made. We're so grateful. Welcome to the family. For everyone else, mungu wa bariki. And uh, stand firm in your trial. For it's in Jesus' holy name, we give thanks and praise for today. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Listen, if this message blessed you, please be sure to share it with someone whom you love. Share it with a friend, a colleague, anyone. And then also, listen, support us. Support this ministry so that we can be able to make more dope content and be able to spread this message of the kingdom to as many people as possible. And then, make sure that you subscribe. Sawa, subscribe. Subscribe, wherever the button, subscribe, subscribe. God bless you guys.